bless the Lord. Would you get your Bibles and meet me in the first gospel, Matthew's gospel, chapter 2. Matthew chapter 2. Matthew chapter 2, verse number 1. After Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea during the time of King Herod, Mag Magi came from the east and they came to Jerusalem. You may be seated. I want to uh, I want to talk tonight about God's bakery. About God's bakery. The Global Olympic Games date back to 1896, which was held in Athens, Greece, with 14 nations participating in the inaugural events. Since then, it's been held in different countries around the world. Every two years, cities around the world compete for the chance just to be able to be the host. The selection is actually made seven years before the game even starts. Before the game even starts, the city is chosen seven years prior. The International Olympic Committee bases its decision on who will host the Olympics is predicated on can they accommodate a large number of tourists, a great crowd of journalists, and an ag aggregation of athletes. Ample ac accommodations is a requirement that cannot be compromised. The city must have an efficient transportation infrastructure that is organized to avoid delays since the Olympic Games are on a very strict schedule. There also has to be ample security that will prevent any terroristic attacks on the athletes who have come from around the world. They must have all the venues necessary. They have to be up to date and built at a high standard. My dear friends, it is against this scale how Tokyo beat out Istanbul, Qatar, and Madrid because they didn't have what it takes to host something of a global proportion. The question I've got to ask you, albeit rhetorically, if it's that rigorous to host the Olympics, I can only imagine what was the determining factor Yahweh used to determine what city Jesus would be born in. Why not host him in the holy city of Jerusalem? Why not allow him to incubate in the home of the Olympics the cultural hub of Athens. And I want to unpack for the time that has been least to me tonight on why it is that Bethlehem was chosen. From all of our childhood Christmas plays, we remember that an angel visited Mary and did so in Luke chapter 2 and announced that the Lord was with her and shall bring forth a son named Jesus. No matter where it is that you find yourself this evening, tonight, I want you to lay hands on yourself and make a declaration that your soul needs to be reminded of. Would you declare out loud, the Lord is with me. Yeah. Not long after the uh, choreography of uh, Kairos kicks in, she has to travel with her fiance, Joseph, to a little place called Bethlehem. Hear this, that is not where Mary is from. It's 
not where she lives, but she has to end up in Bethlehem, which is 80 miles, hear this, it's 80 miles from where she got the visitation. I want to ask you, how far are you from your call? Something very critical that I need you to marinate on tonight is you are very rarely called and delivered in the same place. Where God calls you is not necessarily where you will be delivered. So some of you who are feeling a restlessness and you are being pushed out of what Alice Walker calls the temple of my familiar because you were called there doesn't mean you'll be delivered there at the time Bethlehem its size and rank is uh, just a bleep on the screen it's um, six miles south of Jerusalem it is uh, merely a truck stop on the way to Egypt There was no prominence in Bethlehem until Herod built his fortress. I want you to go with me to Micah chapter 5. Micah chapter 5. And I want you to look at one verse. Micah 5 verse number 2. For those of you who are just logging on, somebody type it on the screen so that they can catch up. Micah 5 verse number 2. But you, Bethlehem, Though you are small amongst the clans of Judah, out of you will come one who will rule over Israel. So why would uh, Yahweh choose Bethlehem? I need you to hear this. He had to choose Bethlehem because God needed to model that he can shift the unimportant to the relevant. Before this moment, nobody paid attention to Bethlehem until Jesus was born there. The reason why I'm telling you that is because I don't want you at this tick of the watch to confuse size with significance. There are preachers who call me around the uh, around the clock from around the world asking me how do they do ministry when they're not in a mega church. And I said to them, as I say to you tonight, as a reminder, that Martin Luther King Jr. never pastored more than 300 people. Whatever city he was in, he was never in the lead church. But it was a 300-member pastor that changed the world. Don't let your size confuse your significance. God chose an unlikely girl and an underwhelming young man to usher in catastrophic significance. Many of you are looking at resumes as qualifiers for your assignment. Mary did nothing great but be available. Joseph did nothing monumental but crucify his ego. Many of you will never partner to birth something great because you can't do either. Can you be a part of something in which you get no credit? Can you birth something that is not yours? Will you allow something to flow through you that will not be attached to you? Isn't it amazing that he chooses a 14-year-old girl who's not in Jack and Jill? 14-year-old girl whose parents are so nondescript that their pedigree is never mentioned. Isn't it amazing that when trying to find a mate For Mary, they chose, hear this, a blue-collar worker who had no college degree, had no finesse, 
and had no background. God is looking in this season for Bethlehemites. People who do not have the name don't have the background, don't have the pedigree, but they are available to be used by God. And I'm believing, I'm talking to somebody who doesn't even understand that what makes me significant is that God added extra to my ordinary. The reason why people can't figure out who it is that I am, because without him, I am nothing. But when God steps into my life, everything around me shifts. And that's why a lot of people have problems with me is because they can't get past my normalcy. They are irritated that I am regular and don't understand that I, um, I'm just a Bethlehemite. No emperor had ever come out of Bethlehem. No general had ever come out of Bethlehem. No ruling governor had ever come out of Bethlehem. But God used a nondescript place and used nondescript people to bring something into the world that would shift everything. Well, I don't want you to be confused and think that the very first time that we find Bethlehem is uh, when Jesus is born. The first time that we find Bethlehem, and I want you to journey and meet me there, is in Genesis 35. In Genesis 35, Jacob is uh, a fugitive. He is um, plastered all over post offices as the most wanted. He is a renegade and he is a refugee. He has tricked his brother out of his birthright. And Esau is so mad that he wants to kill him. I want you to just lift up that hand. I want to speak something over you, and I need you to hear me very well. I'm talking to you even uh, if you're across the globe. I need you to hear this. I am talking to you because of the unrelenting power of the Holy Ghost. There is nobody who can take your anointing. Whatever it is that God has for you, it doesn't matter what they say, what traps they set up, what rumors they spread, it will be of no effect because what God has for you, it is for you. Here's the only ones who I want to celebrate in this room is if you had to deal with people who thought they had authority over your destiny and thought that they would be able to circumnavigate the ultimate will of God over your life. I don't care if it was your teacher, your neighbor, the lawyer, the banker, or your mother. None of them will be able to talk against what God has placed on your life. So he's on the run because his brother wants to kill him. And the truth of the matter is he's been running for 14 years. And at the end of 14 years, God tells him, your time of running and hiding is over. Hallelujah. I don't care if it's been 14 months or 14 weeks or 14 days. I am talking to you. Your season of running is now. Oh, you know you are called. Your season of avoiding it. You know what you are supposed to do. Your season of acting in false humility. You know what your gift is. God said you can't run from it. The Lord then calls him. I need you to hear this. God calls him to where there's a threat on his life. I, 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 I thought in the time of trouble he hides me. <laughs> but in Genesis 35 verse number 19 he's headed, y'all ain't going to believe it, to Bethlehem. As a, as a fugitive, as an outlaw. He's headed to Bethlehem and something, um, uh, something happens that is so unseemly that on the road to Bethlehem, hear this, his wife dies. His wife dies, but she does not die before birthing Benjamin. I think I've lost you. 
He, God calls him to a place where there's a threat on his life and on his way to Bethlehem. His wife dies, but not before she gives birth. I, uh, I think I lost you. The terrain to Bethlehem is so rocky that it would be almost impossible for a last trimester pregnant woman to handle the journey. Oh my God. So on the road to Bethlehem, the same road Mary was on. God help me. <laughs> the, the, the same road Mary is on. Uh, his wife dies, hear this, while birthing. And God uh, says, I then have got to fix this. So I'm sending them to Bethlehem just to give a message to people in the middle of a global pandemic that you will not die until you deliver. Yeah. Huh. That everything that's in you, I don't care how bumpy the road is, I don't care what you got to deal with, I don't care what the CDC says, I don't care what's happening at the hospital, I don't care what it is that's happening with the vaccine or the mask, I speak over your life, you shall not die, but you shall live to see the glory of the Lord. You've got to live to deliver. She died and never made it to Bethlehem. She died in the exact same posture as Mary. But she lived through the bumpy road. There are so many people who could never live through your journey. There are so many people who could not handle your path. There's so many people who would have waved a white flag and surrendered if they had to go through three blocks of what you've had to endure. Forget walking a mile in my shoes. Could you get to the corner store with all of the emotional and financial and psychological stress? I went through it, but I'm still carrying. I, I went through it, but I didn't abort the process. I went through it, but I refused to let the enemy have the victory so the very first time we find Bethlehem is the place of a miscarriage the next time that we find Bethlehem um, we find out um, that Bethlehem you're not going to believe it is uh, the home of a gentleman I'm not sure you've ever heard of before. It is the hometown of a, of a guy by the name of Boaz. Yeah. Now, um, a drought had uh, taken place in Bethlehem that is inordinate um, because um, people are dying everywhere. They're dying everywhere. And yet uh, Boaz has fields that are ripe while other people are uh, filing bankruptcy, while other people are dealing with foreclosure, while other people are being terminated from their job, Boaz is prospering in the middle of a drought. As a matter of fact, um, uh, Boaz is given a nickname. Uh, they're not calling him Bo. I want you to know what they call him. They, they call Boaz... Uh, kinsman redeemer now uh, in contemporary times I need you to understand what kinsman redeemer means kinsman redeemer means um, family members in ancient times hear this could redeem or buy back family members who are in slavery I think I lost you uh, so he is wealthy, but he is not wealthy uh, to accumulate stuff. He is wealthy, and then he has ordained the title. You are the one that can bring family members out. 
You, you, you are the one. Whatever family is in bondage, whatever family is shackled, whatever family is swallowed by addiction, you carry the anointing to bring them out. I feel like there's some Boazes who are connected tonight who know that's the oil I got, that whatever is connected to my bloodline, whatever is connected to my last name, whatever is connected to my DNA, the oil on me is going to set them free. And y'all ain't shouting why? Because you want your family to die in bondage. But the devil is a lie. You got to speak with authority. Satan, get your grimy hands off of my family members. I am anointed for it. Elimelech is from Bethlehem but dies. His two sons are from Bethlehem but dies. Why? Because they don't have Boaz's anointing. They are people who have confused their relationship with you who think that because they know you from where you are from God help me that they got the right to handle you any kind of way my anointing ain't set up like yours it's, it's something different and peculiar and special that is on my life um, so he says I, I am anointed uh, to bring family members out the, the act demonstrates a word I want to introduce to you tonight. I want you to write it down. That word is chest. C-H-E-S-E-D. C-H-E-S-E-D. Uh, chest uh, translates as a loving kindness of mercy and meeting needs of those in covenant. You are anointed. Hear this. To deliver those you are in covenant with. Mm -hmm. So, so people, here it is, who do not want connection with you, it is their loss. God is getting ready to do something, hear this, to illumine the eyesight of family members who don't recognize the value of what you carry because you are not run of the mill. The anointing on your life, hear me, as a kinsman redeemer is not for arbitrary strangers. But there's a family member who is in need tonight who don't even understand because of the glory that circumnavigates around your life. Here it is that you get ready to get a breakthrough for them. I need to hear a charge in this atmosphere because you get ready to direct angels. God, wherever my cousin is tonight, wherever my niece is tonight, wherever my brother is tonight, whatever my sister is into tonight, I want you to deliver them because the covenant is too heavy. So I've got to go back to um, our original question. Why was Jesus born there? And why do we need to be citizens there? Bethlehem means house of bread. I want you to write that down. Bethlehem means house of bread. Of bread. Beth is house, Lehem is bread. Bethlehem is the house of bread. Jesus is born in the house of bread. Yeah. It's a staple of nourishment. It is necessity for survival. God's provision is always trapped in bread. B bread of heaven. Feed me till I want no more. God, I can't hear nobody. See, S Satan knew the authority of the oil that was on Jesus' life. So that after he had fasted for 40 days, he said, 
turn these stones into bread because he wanted him to have some connection to home but he knew this is not the communion bread I'm looking for I'd rather starve to death than have a Negro take credit for feeding me I'd, I'd rather go without than having you hold it over my head what you did for me in the season of my drought um, when the children of Israel are oppressed for 400 years God heard their cry when they were in a job that they weren't getting paid for God heard their cry when their housing conditions did not match standard he heard their cry when they were sick but could not afford medical attention God heard their cry and God said hear this this only applies to worshipers who have been wounded hallelujah you just missed what I said uh, there is something that hearkens to the ear of God to those who know how to worship him while you're still in need it's easy to give him glory when you got it all but can you worship him when you can't stand your job? Will, will you worship him when you got a dark night of the soul? Can, can you give him glory when you're fighting depression? Will, will you bless him when you don't feel like fighting no more? When God heard their cry. I want you to see what God did. When he heard their cry, you're not going to believe it. He started to send manna. What is this? Yeah, they, they are in a desert. I don't want you to miss it. They are in a desert, and then Bethlehem starts falling. Oh. Y'all just missed it. I, I said they're in a desert place, and Bethlehem just starts coming down. I wonder if anybody knows it this way. Here's the remix. When the praises go up, that's when Bethlehem starts coming down. The bread has got to sustain you. It, it, it is sustaining you to nourish you so you, don't, so you don't die in your desert season. So you are not malnourished while you're on your journey. So he says, I've got to send uh, Bethlehem to the desert so that I can culti cultivate dependence. What do you mean? I got to cultivate uh, dependence uh, so I am not sending loaves of bread. No. I am just giving you bread for the day. <laughs> Eat all of that and then tomorrow I'm going to give you some more bread. It is out of that that David wrote, watch this, that you got to understand uh, that there is something significant about give us our daily bread. And so I'm not looking for a once a year blessing. I'm looking every day for God to do something. How many of you all know before midnight comes, there's a blessing with my name on it that God is going to have to release because I done gone all day and still don't have daily bread. And in John 6, John 6, uh, something telling takes place. Um, John 6, something telling takes place. Um, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm from uh, Baltimore. And uh, so I, I call myself a Baltimorean. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I, I need you to uh, lean in to John 6 and look at verse 35. And I want you to see how um, Jesus introduced himself. I'm from Baltimore. Yeah. So I call myself a Baltimorean. I want you to see how Jesus introduced himself in John 6, 35. Here's what he says. I am the bread of life. Now, th th this don't make sense if he ain't from Bethlehem. <laughs> that, 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 that he connects himself to where it is that he's from. Watch this. Because he says, I'm not going to forget what I came out of. 
See, some of you, God can't use you because you got convenient amnesia. But some of you ought to be shouting because I remember where I came from. I, I remember what I had to crawl out of. I remember the stuff that I had to deal with. I am, Jesus says, the bread of life. Now, in order, in order for him to be that bread, um, then any culinary scientist will tell you, uh, in order for you to have that bread, you've got to have flour. Uh, you got to have salt. You uh, got to have water. God, God help me in here. Uh, but it is incomplete without fire. Bread is not bread. I wish I had a church here until it went through fire. I'm, I'm lost. I better give it to you again. Bread is not bread unless it goes in fire. I'm waiting for y'all to wake up. Bread is not bread until it's been in fire. I'm glad you said it. Come here, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They were incomplete until they were thrown in the fire. I want you to know whatever fire you've been in, it was a part of your process for you to develop into your call. Oh. I better close. My time is almost up. Uh, I'm going to go to Matthew chapter 14. Uh, Matthew chapter 14. Verse number 18, would you run to Matthew chapter 14, please? I got to show you this, Matthew chapter 14. Uh, Jesus has been teaching all day. And uh, after Jesus has been teaching all day, uh, the sun is going down. One of the deacons from the church run up on Jesus and, uh, and said, uh, send them away. Feeding all of these people is not in the budget. And, and Jesus then uh, says, what do you have? This is going to be crazy. I need y'all to have it. Uh, what do you have? And uh, they found what um, you didn't pay attention to. They found a boy of no acclaim. Who is unimportant, who is insignificant, who never registered on the radar. A boy who would remind him of a young Joseph. That all he had um, was two fish and five loaves of bread. That's all he had for 5,000 people. All he had was two fish and five loaves of bread for 5,000 people. And that ain't even including women and children. Two fish uh, and five loaves of bread. That's, that's, that's all he got. He's got two fish and uh, five loaves of bread. That, that's all he got is two fish and five uh, loaves of bread. That, that's all he got. Two fish and five loaves of bread. And here's what's significant is um, he took the bread. He gave thanks. Did, did you read that in your Bible? Uh, now, don't forget, outside of these uh, five loaves of bread, uh, one, two, three, four, five. Uh, outside of these five loaves of bread, don't forget he's got two fish. He's got five loaves of bread and two fish. Y'all stay with me. But he takes the bread. Uh, he blesses it. He thanks God for it. Here it is. And, uh, and he breaks it. Now the reason why this is important, I'm in Matthew chapter 14, is that he never Touch the fish. God help me. He, I'm, I'm, I'm in Matthew's gospel. He, he, he broke the bread, but let the fish stay in place. The, the reason why that's important is because the bread is where he's from. Mm -hmm. So he says, I, I got to stop. 
the spirit of poverty that is hovering over where I live. It ain't just about feeding these people, but whoever is connected to me who has been living in lack or want, I am breaking it in this season. And I need those of y'all that have the God kind of faith, I need you to open up your mouth because God said, if you praise me, I'll break it. If you lift me up, I'll break it. If you magnify me, I'll break it. If you worship me, I'll break it. The reason why you ought to shout tonight is God told me to tell you, just for the worshipers, God's bakery is now open. Whatever you ask for, it shall be given to you exceedingly, abundantly, beyond what you can think, what you can dream, what you can imagine. I need you to elbow your neighbor and say you'll never hunger again. You'll never thirst again. You'll never be in need again. Evidence. I got to show you this. Evidence that after they had um, finished feeding them, Jesus then gives out baskets and tells them, collect the bread. Never collect the fish. Y'all ain't saying, because the fish won't be able to sustain. How many of you all know I got enough to last me the rest of this year? I have never seen the righteous forsaken or you see begging for bread. You ought to shout for the God of more than enough. You ought to praise him that my cup runneth over. Surely, 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 goodness, mercy will follow me. Give me my bread. Give me my bread. Give me my bread. Bread of heaven, feed me. Bread of heaven, feed me. Bread of heaven, feed me. Till I want no more. You ought to praise him. Your cupboard will never be dry. Your account will never be open. The bread is coming. The bread is coming. The bread is coming. Lift up that hand, please. Hallelujah. 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 I want you to lift that hand as high as you can. So many people have become sick of church because they are choking on stale bread. <laughs> the bread from yesterday is not the bread for today. How many of you believe fresh bread is coming? God, I don't want no day old miracle. I, I need God to do something now. I need late in the midnight hour for God to turn it around. I want to pray for you. I want to pray for you tonight. Whether you're in London, whether you're in Germany, whether you're in Jamaica, whether you're in Nigeria, whether you're in Atlanta, I want to pray for you tonight that you will receive his daily bread. Hallelujah. I want when the blessing comes, for you to pinch yourself and say, I must be in Bethlehem. I, God, I can't hear nobody. I'm, when the check shows up, 
I want you to tell yourself, welcome to Bethlehem. When you thought you weren't going to have enough, I need you to pull your children together and say, baby, God don't put us in Bethlehem. I seen him do it. I seen him do it. There are 54 citations, 54 citations of Bethlehem in the Bible. 54 mentions of Bethlehem in the Bible. And in not one of those 54, hear this, can I ever find one instance of bread being purchased. <laughs> 54 times Bethlehem is mentioned. The house where bread rests, where bread resides, and I can't find anybody buying bread. Why? Because they were raising bread. What God has for you is not for sale. <laughs> what God has for you, I don't know who I'm talking to, cannot be purchased, minimized, or rebated. It's too valuable a price for you to put on the call on your life. I'm gonna challenge every person. I'm gonna challenge every person who can, who will. I'm gonna sow a seed in this moment. Here's what I need you to pay attention to. There's a drought in Bethlehem, but Boaz still is planting. No rain, ground is brittle, but Boaz is still sowing. That's what I'm believing is going to happen for you tonight. I know this may sound exorbitant. While it is the stock market is fluctuating, while it is that the pound is going down, the yen is going crazy, the Bitcoin is not in fact consistent, the dollar is going down to a deep dive. I want to challenge those of you who are believing God. Hear this. I'm planting for my next season. I'm planting. Watch this. Not for this season. I'm planting for the next season. God put in my spirit that we've got to raise in the body of Christ marketplace millionaires. Y'all didn't hear what I just said. I said God is raising up marketplace millionaires. That God is going to bless you with finances because he can trust you to bless the body of Christ. Did you hear what I just said? He's going to bless you with finances only if he can trust you to bless the body of Christ. I'm going to ask those of you that can, I know that this is a high jump. If you can't, I'm not talking to you, but I want 10 of you to give a seed of 540. 10 of you, I want you to give a seed of 540. I want 500 of you to give a seed of 145. I want every other person to get a seed of 54 on tonight because I'm believing that this seed, here it is, in not too many days, in not too many days, in not too many days is coming back to you. How many of you believe your bread ain't gonna run out? How many of you believe you ain't seen your best season yet? How many of you believe that the worst is behind and the best is yet to come? I want you to give that seed tonight. I don't want you to hesitate. I don't want you to deliberate. I've been telling you delayed obedience is disobedience. Delayed obedience is disobedience. Your mother used to tell you, don't make me tell you again. 
because she expected you to move as soon as you heard the direction. So those of you who will, all of our giving prompts are below me. I want you to follow them. I'm telling you, I am believing you're going to yield a bumper crops in the next season. That God's going to do exceedingly abundantly beyond what you can think, dream, hope, or even imagine. I got to say this to you. I'd be reckless and irresponsible to ask you for money and not ask you for your life. I want you to give your life to God tonight. I'm telling you, if you are not saved, you will always be hungry. If you are not saved, you will always be desperate. If you don't have a relationship with God, you'll always act thirsty. He said to the woman, if you knew who was standing in front of you, you would never thirst again. I want you to get saved tonight. I want you to give your life to the one triune God. I want you to get baptized in the grace and the power of his might. And I want you to do it on this night. I'm telling you, God don't have to wait till a Sunday for a breakthrough to happen. But even on a weeknight, God can blow your mind. Anybody seen God do stuff outside of a Sunday? Hallelujah. If you've seen him do it, give God some glory for it right there. I said, if you've seen him do it. Bless his name. I'm excited that you hung out with us on tonight. I need you to know we were on sabbatical for the month of July. This coming Saturday, the King's Table is back open uh, at 10 o'clock. Uh, in the pandemic, we have fed a half million people. Somebody give God glory. 500,000 people have sat at the king's table at new birth you or anybody you know is dealing with food insecurity please push them to our church on this coming saturday uh, on next saturday i am plum pleased to share with you is our back to school extravaganza our back to school uh, extravaganza i think it's on the 15th uh, and on that 14th, thank you. On the 14th, and on the 14th, we've got back to school supplies. And hear this I need you to lean in and get this. We've got 1,000 tablets. One, y'all ain't shouting good. This is a rough crowd. 1,000 tablets that we're giving to young people. I need you to please go and register on our secure website. We want to take care of you. We want to be a blessing to you. On Sunday morning, we're going to be back in worship and I want you to be a part of it. Would you receive the benediction? I want to pray over you. And after I would have concluded, I want you to stay tuned. We've got some video announcements uh, that I don't want you to miss. Do me a favor, please lift that hand. Repeat after me, walk with God and he'll walk with me. Talk with God and he'll talk with me listen to God and he'll listen to me build for God and he'll build for me love God because he first loved me lift that hand as high as you see yourself going now when him who's absolutely able to do anything but fail may God make you sleepless until you help somebody may God make you restless until you help yourself May God irritate you until you have enough sense to worship him. And may God bless you until you have to give stuff away. Henceforth, now and forevermore, the blessed people of God said amen. Stay tuned. I want you to type real quick. The drought is over. Come on. Type it real quick. Come on.